Much has been said about the Swedish warship Vasa, most commonly short dismissive statements about the fact she didn't even make it out of harbour on her maiden voyage before capsizing. But there is much, much more to the history of the ship, her recovery, and the people who served aboard her. In this short video mini-series, with the kind help of the Vasa Museum in Stockholm, and in particular her chief researcher and curator, who we are going to meet later on in the video, we're going to take a much closer look at this ship's history. Today we're going to start with the ship herself, why and when she was built, how she was lost, how she was found, salvaged, and then conserved. For this, we need to go back to the 1500s. Back in the first half of that century, Sweden had stabilised who was in control, and as its independence, with the crowning of Gustav I, of the Vasa noble family. He was now king. He sought to lead Sweden on its own path, leading it out of the Hanseatic League, and thus enabling the country to begin an economic rise that continued through the end of the century. Towards the end of the 1500s, a new king, Sigismund III, managed to briefly plunge the country into chaos and civil war. Under the Vasas, Sweden had begun to turn Protestant, more specifically Lutheran, but Sigismund was Catholic, and as with several other monarchies of the period, this difference between the affiliation of the population and the affiliation of the monarch caused quite a lot of issues. However, he was deposed by his uncle, Charles IX, in 1599, and the country began to recover. Sigismund was still king of Poland and Lithuania, and he kept trying to get Sweden back, which would lead to an ongoing mixture of war and general hostilities between the two countries for the next century, which we'll see reflected in the ship later on. In 1611, Charles was succeeded by his son Gustav II, better known to history as Gustavus Adolphus who, still a teenager, found himself inheriting three separate wars, one against Denmark, one against Poland and Lithuania, and another against Russia. Only Russia had direct land borders with the main bulk of Swedish territory, and even then, the heart of Sweden was really only accessible to any of those three enemies if they came by sea. Sweden, of course, also heavily relied on seaborne trade, and the new king had plans to expand his holdings which would also require seaborne transport and supply going in the other direction, and so the need for a strong navy was triply obvious. Formerly, Sweden's warships had generally been small single-deck craft. Swift, agile, and with a relatively shallow draft, they worked very well for guarding merchantmen, hunting pirates, and navigating the often close and island-filled confines of the Baltic. But, as such, they weren't all that good at fighting anything much larger than themselves in a major engagement. Combined with the rise of naval artillery, Gustavus Adolphus saw the need to construct much larger vessels. These would have two full gun decks equipped with numerous heavy guns. This would have then allowed the Swedish navy to dominate the Baltic and reduce losses to its own navy, since such large ships could, even if they got stuck into fights where they were badly outnumbered, still expect to come off victorious. And so, in 1625, the king sent for his master shipwright, Henrik Hibbertsen, supplying him with measurements and sketches of his own devising. Although master of Stockholm's primary shipyard, Hibbertsen was Dutch by birth, which was just as well since a lot of the ship's rigging plan, amongst other things, would be based on the latest Dutch designs. Materials began to be gathered, and the final details of these new ships were drawn up. The contract was to build four vessels, two large ones first, followed by two slightly smaller ships. The first large vessel, Vasa, was laid down in late 1626, but by this point the master shipwright was badly ill, and by summer he had passed work over to his assistant, Hein Jakobsen, and overall control of the shipyard itself to his wife, Margareta Nilsdotter. He would pass away in the spring of 1627 as preparations were being made for the ship's launch. Shipbuilding of this period was a fairly complex process, but it didn't quite involve the same levels of fixed dockyard industry and widespread infrastructure as it would in later periods. Whilst many of the ship's materials were brought to the yard from other places, even in some cases other countries, some other elements, such as iron nails, as well as a degree of final finishing to the timbers, would all be done on site. 
But to get a little bit more detail, let's ask someone who's spent years learning about and curating the ship about its background. Okay, so we find ourselves here in the rather wonderful Vasa Museum, and this is a replica of the great cabin aboard the Vasa because uh, obviously we're not going to go start filming inside the ship um, for, for this interview, but I'm very, very kindly joined by a special guest who knows an awful lot more about this ship than I could possibly ever hope to. So if you'd like to introduce yourself for the viewers. Yes, I'm uh, Dr. Fred Hawker. I'm the Director of Research here at the Vasa Museum. And thank you very much for uh, your time and patience in putting up with me and what I'm sure will be many questions. That's a pleasure. Um, so we find ourselves obviously looking at this, this ship, this magnificent example of uh, Swedish naval architecture, obviously very rare, very well preserved. Could you tell us a little bit about what was the background? Why was this ship even built in the first place? In the 1620s, Sweden, uh, under its king Gustav II Adolf, was at war with Poland, Lithuania, under their king Sigismund or Sigmund III. Uh, these two men were cousins. In fact, Sigmund had been king of Sweden in the 1590s and been deposed by Gustav Adolf's father, but maintained his claim to the throne. Uh, and so at one level, there was a dynastic war over the issue of who was the rightful king of Sweden going on in the 1620s. At the same time, the economics uh, of Baltic trade were such that the ports on the Polish coast, particularly places like Riga, uh, Gdansk, uh, were exporting a huge volume of valuable material to the West. Uh, and everybody and his brother wanted uh, some piece of that pie. The King of Denmark uh, had established a toll at the entrance to the Baltic, so he got a little piece of everything of that. Uh, and Sweden wanted a piece of the pie as well. And so in 1621, Gustav Adolf had taken his army and invaded what is now Latvia and conquered the city of Riga, which then became the largest city in Sweden, and used that as a base through the 1620s to try to capture more of the Polish coast. In order to do that, he needed to modernize his navy uh, and adapt it to that particular task of convoying troops uh, defending a bridgehead uh, on a hostile shore, interdicting trade, uh, redirecting that trade to ports controlled by Swedish authorities so it could be taxed, uh, and then to prevent interlopers, such as the Danes, from getting involved. And so in the course of the 1620s, uh, he uh, signed a large number of contracts for new vessels to renew the navy from the large navy of small ships he inherited from his father. But also he had his own ideas and started building ships of a new type. And that's what Voss is. Okay, so the, obviously when we look at ships slightly earlier than this, because Bass is obviously an example of the early 1600s, um, when we look back at ships of the 1500s, they're very often the classic galleon, very high stern castle, very high forecastle, um, usually nowhere near as substantial as this. Uh, look at the English Armada, uh, well, not the, the English attempt to stop the Spanish Armada, and some of the Spanish ships are a thousand tons and they're seen as monsters. And there's a couple of English ships of that scale, and almost everything else is half that size or less by, by tonnage. And the Spanish ships are mainly designed for sort of one broadside and grapple. The English ships are designed to bombard more with gunnery, but it kind of works, but also kind of doesn't um, because of the lighter weight of the weaponry that they've actually got. Um, whereas when you look at this, this looks like a it's very slightly archaic, but still of the same design lineage that you'd expect to see in the Napoleonic Wars. It's got full gun decks. Um, it's clearly designed for a line of battle type situation. So how did how did they get from the flo floating castle concept of the late 1500s to this in the space of a few decades? The uh, Vossa is uh, in between, poised in between two worlds of naval combat. Uh, in the 16th century and up to Vossa's time, uh, most naval officers expected a battle to be decided by boarding. If you, if you had artillery, it was for softening up the enemy before you went hand to hand because the tactical goal was to capture an enemy ship, not to sink it. Uh, if you capture a vessel, uh, 
you are changing the balance of naval power by two, you're gaining one and the enemy's losing one. Whereas if you sink the enemy, you only change it by one. <clears throat> and so uh, Swedish tactics, as well as the tactics of other countries, were focused very much on boarding. Uh, in the 1620s, Gustav Adolf, the king of Sweden, was a keen artillerist. And he believed that the future of naval warfare would not be hand-to-hand -hand combat, that it would be artillery duels between heavily armed gun platforms. He turns out to have been right, but he was about a generation ahead of the curve. And so in addition to ordering conventional Swedish vessels, which at that point were ships that had usually one full deck of guns, usually 12-pounder cannon, uh, and a very large crew, two-thirds of whom were Marines or soldiers who were expected to be able to fight a boarding battle. He also started to order a small number of much bigger ships with multiple gun decks fitted with much heavier guns. Uh, Vossa was one of the first of those ships with two full gun decks, a total of pierced for 72 guns, uh, and with uh, a unitary armament of 24 pounders on both gun decks. And in fact, the original design brief was for 24 pounders throughout. Just that's not practical. And so, but this is not in the sense a line of battleship because the idea of line tactics were still a generation in the future. Gustav Adolf still for, expected that ships would fight one on one duels against each other and that by having a much more heavily armed gun platform, you would have the advantage. As it turns out, the configuration of Vossa does presage what would become the backbone of line of battle fleets in big countries like uh, England and France. It has two full decks of guns plus lighter armament on a third upper deck, which is basically the design that became a third rate in the 17th century and eventually the 74 gunship of the 18th century. It turns out to have been the best balance, the best compromise between speed, seaworthiness, firepower and operating cost. Um, but Vossa was just a little bit ahead of that. It's small compared to a third rate. A third rate normally uh, would have a tonnage, tons burthen, somewhere around 11, 1,200 tons. Vossa is about 800 tons if you measured it in English tons burthen. It displaces 1,250 tons, whereas a, an English third rate from, say, the 30, gun, the 30 ships program of the 1670s is somewhere closer to 1,800 tons. So it's a, you could think of it as a, an undersized third rate uh, in that sense. And so it's looking forward to the period when gunnery is the dominant tactic, but not yet looking forward, not yet anticipating line tactics or coordinated fleet actions. And from the sounds of it, with the small numbers ordered, even if they had wanted to put them into a line, they wouldn't have had enough ships to form, really form a, a line of battle. Correct. There were really only four ships built in the Vossa class. There were other ships that had been ordered, and the Navy didn't want these ships. Naval officers, professionals, believed that boarding tactics were still the future. Uh, and they succeeded in winning battles in, in the 1640s that way. And it wasn't until the 1650s when they came up against the, the Dutch fleet that had been hardened in the First Anglo-Dutch War that they understood that it was a different world. Uh, and so there were a small number of these vessels. They are still, the crews are still divided into one-third mariners and two-thirds soldiers or marines. Uh, but they're not really practical for fighting a boarding battle. They're very heavily armed. Vasa, we believe, was the most heavily armed ship in the world in terms of firepower when it uh, entered service. And as we often say, it was the most heavily armed ship in the world for about 45 minutes. <laughs> so with respect to the, the armament, obviously the higher up you put a gun of a specific weight, the more that affects the ship's stability. So was that taken into account by the designers? Were the, were the guns on the upper deck slightly different, albeit the same poundage of shot, or were they just all the same? The guns on the two gun decks are the same type of lightweight 24-pounder. It's a new type of gun that had been developed for the Navy, or not for the Navy, excuse me, a new type developed for the Army as a road portable siege artillery. The, the conventional 24-pounder uh, in this period was a gun that weighed two to two and a half tons and was about four meters long. These throw the same size shot, but they're a little less than three meters long and only weigh a ton and a quarter. So you could say half the size of a conventional 24-pounder and only about 30% more weight than a 12-pounder. They trade away range for that weight. 
Uh, and so you can't achieve the same uh, distance that you can with the older guns. But naval tactics at the time didn't require long-range gunnery. Um, and so it was possible to create a ship that had that same type of gun on both the upper and the lower gun decks, or the lower deck and the middle deck, as you would say in mm -hmm. England. Um, and then the upper deck, while the initial design thinking called for the same guns there, that's probably a step too far. And they ended up using lighter weight guns uh, on the upper deck. Mm -hmm. And I noted when we were going around the museum earlier, these guns are all on the four-wheel naval gun carriage, so they, that they are properly capable of being used and manoeuvred at sea as opposed to 30, 40 years ago when a lot of ships were still sailing with two-wheel um, land carriage type carriages. Uh, correct. Uh, we do know of uh, one naval vessel, a Swedish naval vessel of this period uh, that sank the year before and all of its artillery and carriages have been recovered in Poland. And it was carrying 20 guns and two of those were still on two-wheel carriages. But they were two captured Russian guns of a very strange size. They, they just didn't fit the standard pattern. All of Voss's guns were on four-wheel carriages, even down to the little one-pounder balconettes <laughs> on the quarterdeck. There are four small ports in the transom for swivel guns. Uh, they don't ever seem to have been mounted. Okay. So it's, Vasa is built presumably as the flagship um, of, of the Swedish Navy, um, built here, well, not here in the museum space, but nearby, in, uh, near Stockholm. Um, it's obviously required a fair bit of effort and... I guess the inevitable question when it comes to the ship, it's with us now because it ended up on the bottom of the, the sea very quickly. The traditional narrative says that it was poorly built, too tall, too heavy, too thin, um, not enough beam, sailed out and basically keeled over at the first sign of a strong wind. Um, but from what we've been talking about uh, before we started recording this, that's not entirely correct. Um, would you care to uh, elaborate? Sure. Why the ship sank is always the, the big question here. Um, I don't think it's by the most interesting thing we can ask about the ship. There's a lot more information yeah. there. But it is the, the, the essential dramatic question. Why did mm -hmm. the ship only last for less than an hour in service? Um, and, and I think I'll go back a step from that mm -hmm. to talk about the nature of ship design. Today, when we design a ship, we can calculate its stability reasonably accurately from a paper design because we have an accurate mathematical model of how stability works. Uh, and we have the necessary mathematical tools to do that. Basically, you need calculus uh, and you need an accurate mathematical model. Neither of those things existed in the 1620s. Calculus was not discovered yet for another half century. And an accurate model of stability wasn't created until the middle of the 18th century. And so to design a ship, you had to base it on experience of ships you built previously. If you're going to build a warship that's going to carry substantial deck weight, that's a tricky compromise. Uh, it it it's alters the center of gravity unfavorably. But if you're only going to carry one deck of guns, there are a lot of solutions that will work. I like to think of it as the designer is aiming at a target. And if he's designing a ship with one deck of guns, it's a very big target. It's not hard to hit it on, off the drawing board uh, because there are a lot of different design decisions and compromises, combinations that will work. Um, however, once you go to multiple gun decks, having that much weight above the water in terms of armament and that much ship side above the water, that big target that you're aiming at as a designer is a very, becomes a very small target very quickly. And it's almost impossible to hit it straight off the design board, the drawing board, without the mathematical tools we use today. And so what we see throughout the 17th century and into the 18th century is that multiple gun deck warships are very often not very good ships when they're first put into service. And so the standard procedure is to build it, sail it in trials to evaluate what its actual performance is, and then make the necessary alterations to, to make it useful. Uh, even late in the 17th century, Victory famously turned out to carry her lowest tier of guns lower than people thought was ideal, and she couldn't use them effectively in bad weather. 
to the victory of essentially them became instead of a hundred gun ship a, a sixty four five gun ship. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so people understood that multiple deck ships were a, a difficult compromise. Uh, and so you, there were a number of standard measures for fixing them, like girdling or shortening the rig, or even as much as simply cutting them down the deck. So the problem that Vasa had was a typical problem. It just had it into a very bad degree. And so once the ship was in service, it became clear that the problem was, as was appreciated at the time, that the ship is simply too tall and too heavily built above the waterline for the amount of ship that is in the water. As I mentioned earlier, a typical third rate carrying this armament later in the century would have 50% more total displacement. There would simply be a lot more ship there to carry that level of armor. The armament itself is not the problem. We know from looking at broadside wooden ships of the 17th century and later, that for multi-gun deck ships, the armament should weigh approximately 5 to 7% of the total displacement. In Voss's case, it's right at 5%, at the low end of good. So the, the guns themselves are not the fundamental problem. The problem is that the headroom is too much uh, in the ship. The, the height of the decks is simply higher than it needs to be. And that means every deck above the lowest gun deck is higher above the water than it really ought to be. And the structure that's carrying the guns is too heavily built. Mm -hmm. There's just too much ship there uh, for the guns that it's carrying, for the armament that it's carrying. The deck beams are larger and more closely spaced than they need to be for the weight of the armament they're carrying. We don't know why the designer made those choices, although the the high headroom in the decks is fairly typical for Dutch design in this period. Yeah. Uh, but, that, but that put the center of gravity too high. Yeah, I mean, because I, I, obviously we're standing in the, the replica of the Great Cabin, which is all to proper scale. And I know that, okay, I'm 5'11", 6' foot on a good day if I've had a decent amount of sleep, and there's still 2, 3 inches between the top of my head and the lowest part of the beams. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I was on victory in the in the great cabin there. Um, I would basically having be having to stand a few inches away from one of the beams to stop me clocking my head. Right. So that's going to translate into five or six inches lesser deck height in that ship, even though it's a lot bigger, and um, <laughs> that translates, as you say, over multiple decks. Right. In in the case of Vossa, the if, if you you and I are the same height, right around six feet, and we can walk under all the beams in the upper gun deck. We have to stoop a little bit in the lower gun deck. Um, but the average Vasa sailor is not six feet tall. He's five foot five, a meter 65 instead of a meter 80. Uh, and so in fact, uh, he, our sailors could stand up straight between the deck beams if you lowered the deck by a foot, by 30 centimeters. And so you could reduce the, the, the weight by cutting that slice of ship out, lowering the height that the guns are all sitting at in the upper gun deck and then the upper deck, which would improve the stability of the ship somewhat. And if you lighten the structure a little bit, you'd end up with a better <laughs> ship. Uh, at the time of the, the sinking, the inquest afterward had a panel of experts, and one of them put it very well. He said, the ship doesn't have enough belly. There's not enough, by that he meant, there's not enough ship in the water. There's not enough dis total displacement for the amount of ship that's out of the water. And that's the, the fundamental issue. Okay, so yeah, so it's, it's they say, because the, the, the classic argument is, oh, too many guns, etc. And it's actually, it's more to do with the way the ship is built rather, exactly. than, rather than anything else. Yeah, it's, it's more complicated than just too many guns. It's <coughs> how, the, how those guns are put into the mm. ship. It's the, it's the ship's fault, not the armament's yeah. fault. And I suppose this is one of the risks you run of being on the cutting edge. People yeah. haven't done this before. As you say, you've got a small target to aim at, and to extend the analogy, I suppose you don't have you don't also have the sort of the other shots that people have taken at that to compare to, because I'm, I recall them um, even with Sovereign of the Seas, obviously famously even bigger and even more monstrous, and for some obscure reason covered in gold, because <laughs> that's apparently what they do in in that time period. But um, I know that went through multiple revisions of its armament. For pretty much the same kind of reason, it just happened to have the good fortune not to roll over the first time. 
Right. Well, and that, that's fairly typical is that you have to you have to find the balance because you can't calculate it in advance. And the simplest solution was simply mess with the armament, redistribute weight in the ship to lower the weight high up and put that weight in the bottom as ballast. Uh, the next step up is to hurdle the ship, that is build another layer of planking on the outside up to the waterline, which effectively increases the total displacement by more than it increases the weight of the wood you add and makes the ship wider, which will make it more stable. In an extreme case, you could cut it down by a deck. Uh, uh, one expedient was to cut down the rigging, make the ship, make the mast shorter to reduce the lever arm. There's a great case from 1672, the new British warship Prince, the, in the middle of the Third Anglo-Dutch War, turned out to have the Vasa problem, being very tender. And they didn't have time for a more comprehensive fix, and so they took it up to Sheerness, downrigged the ship completely to the point of pulling the lower masts out, recut and sewed the sails, cut six feet off of all the masts, shortened all the rigging, and then put it all back together to make the ship sail a little bit better. Which, and what amazes me is it only took five days to do that, <laughs> that entire process. And it's, all, it's described in John Narborough's Sea Journal, how they went about doing that. You could have done something with Vasa. I think with Vasa, the only solution that really would have worked uh, would have been to cut it down by a deck. Vasa's sister ship, uh, Eplet, the apple or the orb, uh, which was in service for 30 years, uh, was the only difference we know was that it was about three feet wider than Vasa. And that was just enough extra breadth to help sort out the stability issue. But after her first sailing season with all 24 pounders, they changed the 24 pounders on the upper gun deck, the middle deck, for 12 pounders. Uh, which then made her an acceptable, although never a great, sailor. But she survived that first season with her but all she, she made it through the first season long enough to get fixed. Mm. And speaking of those 24-pounders, obviously by, by the time of the Armada, so somewhat before Vasa being built, we do start to see the proliferation of, relatively speaking, mass-produced iron cat cannon and minions and culverins and what, what, what have you. Um, these guns, however, are all bronze. So is that because Sweden couldn't build, forward manufacture iron cannon at the time, or was it because it's the prestige ship, it requires the best materials, and bronze is still the best cannon-making material? It just happens to be very expensive. It does, uh, but Sweden was the world's largest producer of copper in the 17th century. So copper was readily available to make bronze. Uh, as was iron. Sweden also was a major exporter of iron. In fact, the Royal Navy made all the iron work for its ships out of Swedish iron until the late 18th century. Uh, and so Sweden was producing both iron and bronze guns, although they called them <laughs> copper guns, just the way that the British called them brass guns. And part of the difference is brass guns are yellow because they have more tin in them. Copper guns are red because they have less tin. So the Swedes used a very low tin bronze, uh, not quite pure copper. Uh, in their guns. Um, but capital ships, large uh, size guns were made in bronze. Iron guns were used for smaller sizes up to about six or 12 pounders. Um, partly this had to do with the nature of the gun founding process. Iron is a trickier metal to work with uh, and it really wasn't uh, until the middle of the 17th century that people had uh, gotten that process perfected to where it was consistent enough that you could rely on an iron gun, that enough of them would pass proof that it was a practical process to use for large-scale production. And Sweden was producing smaller size guns in, at a large scale in iron already in the 1620s. Uh, and by the 1670s, Sweden had stopped producing any bronze guns. They'd gone completely to iron production. And by the 1680s, Sweden was the largest exporter of cast iron artillery in the world. But the metals industry drove industrial development in Sweden. But bronze guns were always seen as prestige items. Mm -hmm. So the, the biggest ships always carried a certain number of bronze guns because that's just what you did as a capital ship. Sure. Uh, in Voss's case, because the king had ordered uh, an entirely new armament for the ship, and they were casting an armament specifically for one ship, that was done in one place at the Royal Gun Foundry here in Stockholm, uh, which was a bronze foundry. Iron guns were cast out in the countryside near the iron production centers. 
Those copper guns were all made in one factory here in Stockholm. Okay. So with all the decoration that's obviously all over the ship, um, when we were looking at it earlier, you mentioned that a lot of it has a lot of it was relatively well preserved because it was uh, attached to the ship with iron nails, which then degraded very quickly. The, the decoration fell into the mud and was relatively well preserved. Um, if the ship had gone to war, um, the again looking at Sovereign of the Seas as a near contemporary example, when Sovereign of the Seas went to war. A fair amount of the decoration, as I understand, was taken off, but most of the gilding stayed, hence the Dutch calling it the Golden Devil. Right. If Vasa had gone to war or if her sister went to war, would all that decoration have stayed? Would they have taken it off? That's a good question. Uh, almost all the sculptures are simply nailed onto the outside of the ship. So in theory, they could be pried off again. Uh, although the, the size of the nails they use and how nails grip and iron, it would have been a serious job to take the decorations off. So I suspect not. I suspect they were, they were there. But they're also part of the ship's function. They're very often described as decoration, but that's not how someone in the 17th century would have seen it. Every warship ever built has two equally important functions, a physical function and a metaphysical function. The physical function is to be a gun platform or a missile silo or a floating airport. But they only ever fulfill that function a very small part of their lives. And I would bet that the vast majority of all warships ever built in history never fired a shot in anger. However, every warship has a metaphysical function to be a visible symbol of that of its owner's ambition, self-image, and policy. And it fulfills that function anytime someone sees it. So a ship's appearance is part of its function. Nowadays, we paint warships gray, initially because of uh, camouflage. Radar doesn't care what color it's painted, <laughs> uh, so, but we still paint them gray. That, that screams, this is a warship. Nobody paints a container ship that color. Uh, it, it's part of the, the metaphysical function of a warship, to be seen as a warship, to, be, to have that menacing, uh, impressive look. In the 17th century, you were doing the same thing, but in a different way. All of these sculptures are using motifs that people would be familiar with from churches and palaces uh, as a way of communicating some very basic ideas. They tell a story. Uh, and so, for example, we know the name of the ship is Vasa, but the word V-A-S-A or W-A-S-A does not appear anywhere on the ship. But the name appears everywhere. Vasa is a word that means a bundle of sticks a fascine, mm -hmm. which was the heraldic symbol of the royal family. And you find that fascine everywhere. It's on all the guns. It's on the stern in two places. It's in a little shield and a lion paws at the figurehead to tell you that's the name of the ship. The royal coat of arms tells you who owns the ship. There's even a sculptural program at the top of the stern that explains why the ship was built, about the dynastic struggle between the Polish losses and the Swedish losses. And so all of that imagery is sending a very clear message that's part of the ship's metaphysical function. It's why 8% of the total cost of the ship is in all those sculptures. Um, it's why Sovereign of the Seas was so heavily decorated. Charles I was trying to send a very specific political message with that ship. He wasn't just showing off. It's, part, it's a very important part of naval policy is what a ship looks like. It's why your ships visit foreign ports. They don't just go there to replenish. You're showing the flag. You're reminding your enemies not to mess with you. You're reminding your friends that you're there to defend them. And how your ship looks is part of that function. And it's, it's often said that in the sort of the age of sail, if we want to call it that, the the large wooden warship was pretty much the single most technologically advanced and complex piece of technology that humankind had, had built at that point. Um, do you think that's a fairly accurate assessment? Um, I would say it's the largest and most complicated piece of mobile technology. Unfortunately, at this point, we discovered that my camera has a timeout on re video recordings of 30 minutes, and uh, thus we lost the tail end of what was actually a very interesting discussion of a comparison between the technological capabilities and 
complexities of 17th century fortifications as opposed to 17th century warships. But going back to the Vasa herself, the work on completing the Vasa was lagging a little bit. The king expected her to be done by July 25th, 1628, but there was some doubt that that would actually occur. By this point in the summer of 1628, three squadrons of the Swedish navy, led by the Bornan, Trekronor, and Mercurius, respectively, were all ready at sea. Vasa and three smaller vessels were all that was left in Stockholm Harbour as a reserve. Although she'd been pierced for 72 guns, only 64 had been delivered and installed by the time she was called to sail. On Sunday, the 10th of August, 1628, the ship did in fact set sail. She then made it a few hundred metres before a squall caused her to heel, but the ship would right itself and then continue on its voyage, coming up to the island of Beckholmen, where another squall blew in, and she heeled once more. This time, the ship went over further, the 120 tonnes of ballast in her hold not enough, water began to pour in through the lower gun ports, and all of a sudden the ship was foundering. She sank fairly quickly, taking 50 people with her, although the water in the harbour at that point is shallow enough that some of the survivors actually found themselves clinging to the tops of her masts, which were still sitting above the water. Although she'd healed, and therefore you might think she'd capsize, the water that rushed into the ship coming in through the lower gun ports then flowed down into the ship, which actually stabilised it even as it overcame her overall buoyancy. And so Vasa sank almost straight down and settled upright on her keel. The great ship had gone down less than an hour into her maiden voyage, and there she would remain for quite a long period of time. But it wouldn't be too long before people were poking around trying to salvage her. Then she'd be mostly forgotten, then rediscovered, and then obviously brought back up into the museum. So next time we're going to be looking at what happened to Vasa from the moment she slipped beneath the water to when she ended up in the Great Museum Hall where she resides to this day. And then after that we'll take a closer look at some of the artefacts found aboard, her crew, and some more detailed look at the sculptures that adorned her and what they meant. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.